everybody is hearing me okay. All right, my name is Ken Johnson. I am a horticulture educator uh, with U of I Extension. Um, I am located um, in Jacksonville. Um, the counties we cover here are Calhoun, Cass, Green, Morgan, and Scott counties, so kind of west central Illinois. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, native pollinators, um, kind of focusing on those in Illinois. Um, this is just going to be a, an overview of pollinators. We're not going to go into too many specifics on any particular pollinators. Um, but just kind of give, give you guys an idea of what kind of pollinators are out there, um, kind of what you can do to attract them to your, your yards, um, your habitats, um, stuff like that. All right, so first, why should, why should I care about pollinators? Um, they've been in the news a lot lately, the last few years, uh, particularly honeybees, um, colony collapse disorder, um, population declines of honeybees, and just kind of pollinators in general. Um, hear a lot about monarchs, populations being in decline. Um, so why, why do we care about pollinators? Well, there's a lot of, most plants um, cannot reproduce without the help of pollinators. Uh, about 75% 75 per, 75 of the plants in the world um, are pollinated by some type of animal, whether that be an insect, um, birds, bats, uh, stuff like that. And over 90% of our flowering plants are pollinated by insects. So obviously if we didn't have pollinators, we would have a lot less plant diversity out there. Um, and those plants that they pollinate, they provide food for us humans. That's what usually we think about um, is the foods we get from pollinators. Um, but wildlife um, is also going to feed on these plants, uh, migratory birds, uh, stuff like that. And pollinators uh, can include bees, butterflies, moth, wasps, uh, beetles, flies, um, birds and bats. And for this presentation, we're going to focus on the insects. Um, now we're going to talk about birds and bats. They don't really do much um, pollinating in this part of the world. Um, they're more, they do more pollinating in warmer regions of the world. Um, you know, bats out in deserts and stuff um, with cactus and stuff like that. So we will be focusing uh, on the insects for this one. So we talked about, when a lot of people think about pollination, they think about food. So this is just some of the fruits and vegetables that we eat um, that require some kind of animal pollinator in order to reproduce. Um, there's about 150 food crops in the United States um, that need pollinators in order to reproduce. And you can see most of the fruits and vegetables um, we would buy in the grocery store or grow ourselves are stuff that requires uh, pollinators. Um, and it's not just, you know, apples, eggplants, the fruits and stuff, plants like carrots, you know, while we eat the root of those plants, they still need to be pollinated so we can get seed so we can produce those plants. Um, same thing with cotton. Um, you know, we need cotton seed in order to grow more cotton. So it's not just the, the stuff we're eating. Other parts of the plant that we eat still need to be pollinated, those plants do. Um, if those pollinators aren't present, either we're not going to have much, if any, fruit production or we're going to have to pollinate. Uh, the plants ourselves. Um, there are some places in China where they have to pollinate their fruit trees because they've wiped out most of their pollinators in the area. So they have to go around and pollinate individual um, tree fruit flowers and stuff in order to get fruit. So it's not something um, that we really want to do because that's going to be really labor intensive and rather expensive to do. Uh, there are also fruits and vegetables um, that can uh, pollinate themselves, um, but you tend to get larger and more fruit when you have insect pollinating them. Um, so you can see in the pictures here um, are some strawberries. So the OP is open pollinated. So those flowers um, had insects that were able to come to them. They could get in there, they could pollinate the flowers. Um, the ASP strawberry um, is just self pollinated, so insects were excluded. Um, There's no wind, anything like that. And the tea, there was some wind and self-pollination going on there. So you can see the tea is a little bit better than the self-pollinated, but those aren't nearly as nice um, as our open pollinated. So again, you know, the, the strawberries can reproduce, but it's not something that we're, we're going to want to pay money for at the grocery store. You're going to want um, to pick out of your garden. So if you've got strawberries that look like this, you may have some kind of issue going on with your pollinators. You know, it could have been raining or too cool when the plants were blooming for pollinators to visit them. 
Uh, and if we go back to the previous slide, these cucumbers here, um, that's another example um, of poor pollination. If you have cucumbers that are all deformed or crooked like that, they also uh, weren't properly pollinated. So if you see that in your garden, that's what's going on with those. And, and people tend to think about, you know, they just tend to think about pollinators uh, when it comes to food, but they're also very important to the ecosystem. Um, they help plants reproduce, and these plants um, provide a bunch of different services to the eco ecosystem. They clean the air, um, stabilize soils, protect from se severe weather, um, support other wildlife. So it's not just um, food that we need to be concerned about when we're thinking about pollinators. There's a lot of other stuff uh, that's going on with that. All right, so insects and other pollinators, they're not going to go pollinate these flowers out of the kindness of their heart. Um, they're getting something out of this as well. Uh, and what they're going to be after is the nectar and the pollen uh, that these flowers are providing. Um, so these are kind of the rewards um, they give to the insects uh, to pollinate them. That's what they're using to attract them. Uh, and most flowers are going to have their nectaries. So that's where the nectar is going to be uh, produced down at the base, um, by, down by the base of the flower, bottom of the petals. So that way, when a pollinator comes in to try to get to the, that nectar, it's going to brush up against your male flower parts, your stamen, so your anther, which is going to have your pollen. Um, that will then transfer the pollen to that insect. Uh, and they will also brush up against the pistil or the stigma on top here, and then it will transfer pollen to that stigma and start um, the pollination and fertilization process of that flower. Um, and then for those of you that like honey, um, nectar is going to be the base ingredient of honey. Uh, in insects and other pollinators, and pollinators in general, are also going to be after pollen. Um, and these are dust-like grains. Um, they're unique to each flower species. So if you look at this picture um, on the top right here, uh, we've got a bunch of different pollen grains. Um, this is pollen from sunflower, morning glory, hollyhock, Oriental lily, evening primrose, and castor bean. So each different species of uh, plant or flower is going to have a unique uh, pollen grain to them. And the pollen is going to develop um, within the male structures of the flower. So they're going to be produced on the anther. Um, and inside that pollen grain are going to be the sperm cells, um, which is going to be the male uh, gamete. And the pollen consists uh, it's made up of proteins, starch, sugars, fats, minerals, vitamins, and amino acids. And pollinators are going to consume this, um, a lot of them, as a primary food source. So that's what uh, the pollinators are after. Um, pollinator syndromes is something we talk a lot about uh, when it comes to pollinators. Um, and these are different flower characteristics or traits that may appeal uh, to a particular pollinator. Um, so you can kind of use these different traits to kind of predict what kind of pollinator is going to visit um, a certain type of flower that you see there. Um, this is going to be a combination of color, um, whether nectar guides are present, um, odor of the smell of the flower, um, nectar is a present, um, how much is going to be there, um, same with pollen, as well as the flower shape. Um, so these different combinations is going to affect um, the types of pollinators potentially that are going to visit these flowers. Um, and it's important to know that for these syndromes, these aren't set in stone. Uh, these are just kind of generalizations. So if you have a particular flower that, say, attracts bees or something like that, that doesn't mean other insects aren't going to visit that particular flower. Um, it just kind of gives you a good general idea of what could be visiting it or what a particular pollinator is going to look for in a flower if you want to attract a certain type. Uh, another thing, this table that I got, um, this is only part of the table. It does also typically it will include bats and wind pollinated plants on there. So, you know, when we're talking about pollen being limited, um, you have to consider that in compared to wind pollinated plants, which are going to produce a tremendous amount of pollen. So when it says limited, or uh, for some of these different things, that's compared to to wind pollinated plants, which are producing a lot of pollen. So just kind of keep that in mind. So the first group we'll talk about are beetles. 
Um, and this is a group that people typically don't think of as pollinators, but there are quite a few beetles out there that will pollinate. And there are uh, several different plants that rely on beetles as pollinators. So plants that are beetle pollinated tend to be white or green in color. Um, they don't have any nectar guides. Um, the odor uh, can be pretty much anything. It can be from no, no odor to strongly fruity or foul. So you're strongly fruity, maybe something like uh, a sap beetle. Uh, which is this beetle right here in the upper left. So that's going to be going after, usually you'll see them a lot um, around fruit, rotting fruit and stuff like that. So they're going to be attracted to those more fruity smells um, or your more foul smelling, uh, maybe beetles that are attracted to carrion or dung, um, stuff like that. The nectar, this is going to be sometimes be present. Beetles really aren't after nectar as much as they are pollen. So there's going to be quite a bit of pollen um, in these plants that tend to be pollinated by uh, beetles. And the flowers tend to be large and bowl shaped, um, or they can be small and clustered. Um, and you can see here in these pictures, um, right here top left, we have a sap beetle, top right, um, locust boar. Um, both of these are on goldenrod. So again, just goes to show you that just because a particular flower does not meet the pollinator syndrome doesn't mean um, certain types of insects aren't going to visit. And in the middle, um, we've got a soldier beetle um, and flower beetles on the right there on the magnolia. Um, and a flower scarab and a blister beetle down on the bottom. Uh, here are some examples uh, of, of flowers that are commonly pollinated by, by beetles. So top left here, we've got a magnolia. And you can see some of those beetles crawling around down in there. Um, if somebody says they don't understand what nectar guide is, um, we'll talk about those um, when we get into the bees. We'll discuss those a little more um, in detail because those are important to bee pollinated plants. Um, right here, we've got a yellow pond lily, uh, eastern shrub bush right here, and tulip tree on the bottom right. And you can see a tulip tree, um, all these anthers here, so they produce a lot of pollen. So this is going to be something that beetles are after. They tend to eat um, the pollen. Um, beetles are commonly referred to as mess and soil pollinators because they'll go into a flower, um, they'll kind of tear all the petals up, they'll eat the petals, they'll defecate in the flowers, so they just kind of make a mess out of the flowers. It's kind of like having a toddler running around your house. All right, next up is flies, and this is another group um, that tends to get overlooked quite a bit when it comes to pollinators. Um, and for this, I kind of split them up into two different groups. Um, of flies. You have your carrion flies and your flower flies, and these are going to be attracted to two pretty different types of flowers. Uh, typically, when you look at pollinator syndromes, they tend to focus on the carrion flies, um, and these flies are going to be attracted to dark brown or purple flowers. So again, these are going to, that's going to kind of look like carrion, so they're going to be attracted to that. Uh, they don't usually have nectar guides. The odor is going to be putrid. Again, these flies are attracted to, to carrion or dead rotting meat um, or dung, stuff like that, so stuff that doesn't smell good. Um, nectar is usually absent, pollen is limited, um, and the flower shape is going to be a funnel or it's going to be a complex with a trap, and we'll talk about that um, a little more in a couple of slides. So usually with these carrion flowers, um, the flies are going to be attracted to the smell, um, and they're going to think it's, you know, this is something they can lay eggs on. They typically lay their eggs on rotting meat and dung, stuff like that. So they'll visit the flower, they'll realize, hey, this isn't what I'm looking for. Um, so they only stay there. They won't stay there too long. They'll pick up a little pollen. They'll leave and go on to the next flower, trying to find somewhere to lay their eggs. Um, and then flower flies. Um, these are going to have different types of flowers they're attracted to. So these are going to be flowers that are more white, cream, pale, kind of lighter in color. Um, again, there's not going to be nectar guides. Odor is going to be musty to sweet. Um, there is going to be nectar because they are going to be feeding on this nectar. Most of these flies are going to these flowers for nectar. Um, limited pollen, and the flower shape is going to be flat or bowl-shaped with shallow corollas. So the corolla is all the petals put together. That's what a corolla is, so it's going to be kind of smaller, shallow flowers. And this is going to be stuff like um, your surfeit fly, your bee, uh, hover flies up here on the top, um, or your bee flies down here at the bottom. A lot of these are going to, are going to mimic bees and wasps, stuff like that. So they're going to visit flowers that are going to be more attractive to those types of insects as well. 
So here we've got some examples of some of the different flowers um, that flies will visit. So on the left here, um, we've got Jack in the Pulpit. Um, and this is one of those flowers that has the trap type flower. So for Jack in the Pulpit, you have male and female flowers. Um, and the flies that are attracted to this are small mushroom flies or fungus snats. These flowers will kind of emit a fungus type odor, so it's going to draw those types of flies in. Um, if it's a male flower, the flies will fly in there. The sides of those flowers are real slippery, so they can't climb their way out. So they're kind of tumbling all over the place trying to get out, picking up a lot of pollen on them. Um, and eventually, they will find their way to the bottom, and there's a small hole uh, at the bottom of that flower, and they can crawl their way out of there um, and be on their way. Um, if they happen to fall into a female flower, it's also slippery on the sides, so they can't climb their way out. They have a hard time getting their way out. But there's no hole at the bottom there, and they actually get trapped in there, and they will die. But while they're trying to get out, if they visit a male flower, they're going to be covered in pollen, and they're going to be transferring that pollen um, on them to all those different female flowers on the inside of that flower that's pollinating uh, that flower. Um, up at top here in the middle, we've got a pawpaw. Um, and this is um, attracts flesh flies and blow flies. Um, again, stuff that's going to be after you know, carrying and, and dung. I know some people who would grow these. Um, they've actually planted these by dumpsters. Um, you tend to get a lot of flies around dumpsters because those don't smell pleasant. So it's going to draw in a lot of flies. There's going to be a lot of flies that are present when those flowers are blooming so they get better pollination. Um, I've also heard of people going out and putting rotting meat out where they've got pawpaws growing again and drawing flies so you have more pollinators coming into that area and you get better pollination with those plants. Um, top right, uh, we've got trillium. Um, this is another uh, one of those flowers that is pollinated by flies. And then down on the bottom here, um, we've got some of the flowers that our, our flower flies are going to be attracted to. So we've got our, our umbiliferous type flowers, like Queen Anne's Lace, um, Bonacet, uh, Eupatorium. Um, they're on the right, so they're going to like these types of flies. Um, you also see surface flies and stuff a lot of times on asters, um, stuff like that, stuff that has smaller uh, flowers, shallow flowers. Uh, next group is the moths, and now we're starting to get into the, to the different insects that people typically think of um, when we talk about pollinators. So moths, um, we're, for these we're talking about, um, we're going to be talking about moths that fly at night. There are a few species um, that fly during the day, but this is primarily going to be discussing night pollinating uh, moths. So these flowers tend to be pale red, uh, purple, pink, or white, and some of these white ones kind of glow. Um, they'll reflect the moonlight, so it kind of looks like they're glowing. Um, that will attract the moths in. Um, there are no nectar guides. The odor is strong, sweet. Um, it's usually emitted at night when the moths are out. So during the day, you know, we may get some scent or not, not much at all. Um, and then as we get later into the day, into the night, that scent becomes stronger, and it's going to be much more attractive to those moths. Uh, the nectar is going to have quite a bit of nectar. Um, those moths and butterflies, they primarily feed on nectar. They don't really feed on pollen too much. It's pretty much exclusively nectar. Um, and usually that tends to be deeply hidden inside the flowers. So you can see um, on this cock moth down here on the right, they have really long tongues. So they can reach down deep into these flowers that a lot of other pollinators can't get down into. Um, pollen is limited. limited. Again, they're not really after pollen for the most part. And the flowers tend to be kind of your, what you typically think of as a flower um, or long and tubular. Um, and they don't necessarily have a lip. Moths um, tend to hover um, when they feed. So they don't really have a landing platform like uh, flowers do when we talk about butterflies. So some of the, the, the moths we have here, uh, right here is a clear wing moth. So this is one of our day flying moths. And those are going to be more attracted um, by the color of the flower than they are on um, the odor and stuff like that. Uh, primrose moths, right here. So these are probably kind of resting during the day. Um, they're going to be more active at night. Uh, cutworm moth, right here. And again, our hawk moth, you can see they have a really long um, tongue or proboscis. Again, here are some more uh, flowers uh, that are pollinated by moths. So on the top left here, we've got the prairie white fringed orchard. And this is actually an endangered uh, plant here in Illinois. Um, it's considered threatened um, by the US government. Um, during the day, they have, don't have much of a fragrance. But as the night comes along, it becomes stronger. 
And these are pollinated by hawk moth, hawk moths, um, and they produce a lot of nectar, so that's going to attract them. They have a lot of food there to eat. And when those moths come in, um, their heads are going to hit up against those anthers. That's going to transfer some pollen to those moths onto their head, and then they'll then spread that to the female parts um, of the flowers and subsequent flowers. Uh, next on top there, uh, evening primrose. Um, so this is going to be another one open in the evening um, into the early morning. Um, it kind of closes up uh, during the day. And again, this is primarily done by sphinx moths. Uh, down here we've got starry campion. Uh, doesn't have much of a scent, uh, but it is one of those that will open up um, at night. And the final uh, one we've got here is Dame's Rocket. Um, and this one is actually not native. Um, this one is native to Europe, but just goes to show you just because something is not native doesn't mean it's not going to be able to support uh, pollinators. Um, this one's kind of interesting. It's been, been grown in gardens since the Roman Empire, so this one has been grown um, ornamentally by humans for quite a long time. All right, next group, we've got the butterflies. So these are going to be going after flowers that tend to be bright red, purple, um, colorful flowers. A lot of the stuff we like to plant in our gardens because we think the flowers are pretty are going to be the same types of flowers butterflies are going to be after. Um, they do tend to have nectar guides. Um, the odor is going to be faint but fresh. So again, um, smells that are appealing to us. Uh, again, just like moths, there's going to be ample nectar and it's going to be deeply hidden because, again, they have a long proboscis as well, so they can get down deep into flowers that other pollinators can't necessarily access. Uh, again, limited pollen, and they have a narrow tube with a spur. Um, they tend to have a wide landing pad because butterflies will land um, as they feed, so they need something to rest on. Uh, the pictures here at the top, we've got a swallowtail. So that's a typical common butterfly we see here in Illinois. Uh, and then down the bottom, um, we have our monarch. Uh, and here's just um, some different flowers that will uh, that are attractive uh, to uh, butterflies. So we got Eupatorium, Joe Pie Weed on the top left right there. Whoops. Up here um, on the bottom, uh, pra uh, Prairie Blazing Star or Liatris. Down here, our purple cone flower in the top middle, uh, bottom middle, our, uh, butterfly weed or milkweed, and then cardinal flower uh, over here on the right. So if you grow any types of native flowers in your garden, uh, these are some of the more common ones uh, people will grow. So if you're into, if you have a native pollinator garden, you probably have some of these plants out there. And we talk about butterflies and moths. It's also important to have larval food sources. So a lot of our different butterflies and moths, uh, their larvae or their caterpillars are only going to feed on a few different species of uh, plants. Some of them will only feed on one type of plant. It just kind of depends on the type of butterfly. Um, so you can see here some of the more common butterflies we see. These are the type of plants um, that they need for their larvae. So if, they're, if you want to attract butterflies or moths uh, to your garden, um, consider planting some of these larval food sources. That way you draw those adults and they'll lay eggs and they'll kind of stick around longer um, because they have somewhere to lay their eggs. Uh, monarchs. Okay, monarchs. So this, these have been in the news a lot, you know, declining populations. So milkweed, um, they will only feed on milkweed. So if you want monarchs, you need to have milkweed. Um, stuff like buckeyes, they will feed on snapdragons, Viceroy's, Pussy Willow, Plums, Cherries, um, stuff like Tiger Swallowtail will feed on quite a few other different plants. As you can see, some of these are only going to feed on one or two different types of plants. And if you do see a caterpillar on a plant, you know, consider leaving that. That's eventually going to grow up to be a butterfly or a moth. So you know, if you want to have butterflies and moths around, don't kill every caterpillar you see. All right, last group we'll talk about is the bees, and this is what people will typically think of uh, when we're talking about pollinators. Um, these are usually the more most effective group, um, kind of in general, uh, when it comes to pollinating flowers. And again, the, poly the flowers that they're attracted to are also going to be flowers that you know, we humans find attractive, so a lot of flowers we plant are also going to be attractive to bees. So these flowers tend to be bright white, yellow, blue, 
um, or UV. Uh, we can't see the UV, but the bees can't see UV light. Um, so there are different patterns and stuff um, that flowers can have that bees can see that we can't. Um, nectar guides are present, and I believe that's the next slide. Um, we'll talk about nectar guides. Um, the odor um, is fresh, mild, pleasant, and again, um, odors that we find pleasing as well. Uh, nectar is usually going to be present. Um, bees are going to feed on that nectar. The pollen um, usually is going to be sticky pollinated, sticky pollen because they're going to collect that um, a lot of times on their legs or on the underside of their abdomens. Um, they'll bring that back to their nest uh, to feed to their larvae. And the flowers tend to be shallow with a landing platform because, again, um, they tend to land when they feed um, and they are tubular. So nectar guides, um, some of you are probably wondering well, what are exactly our nectar guides. Um, so nectar guides, um, if you look on this picture here on the left, um, right here this yellow flower, this is what it looks like under normal light, so this is what we're going to see. Um, here this is what the flower looks like under UV light, so you can see this darkened area right here. This is kind of guiding the bees um, down into the flower towards the nectar. So the nectar guides are showing the bees the way um, to their nectar to the nectar of the flower so they can get there. Same thing with this foxglove right here. Let me just see all these spots. Again, uh, kind of like lights on a landing strip for a plane, kind of guide you down into where the nectar is so the bees can find that a little easier. So we talk about nectar guides. That's what we're talking about. Not necessarily something we can see sometimes. A lot of times they're UV, um, but the bees can't see them. There we go. Uh, and when we think about bees, bees, people tend to think about honeybees. Um, there are a lot more types of bees uh, out there than honeybees. Um, and actually, this is the last time we'll talk about honeybees because honeybees are actually native to Europe, um, Asia, and Africa. They're not native to North America. Um, so most of the, our native bees, um, they tend to be solitary. Um, a lot of them will nest in the ground. Um, a lot of them are much more efficient at pollinating our native plants um, than honeybees. Um, they often, often tend to fly in cooler temperatures than honeybees um, and tend to show more foraging behavior um, than the honeybees do. So a lot of times they're a lot more efficient at pollinating um, a lot of our flowers and some of our, our native fruits and vegetables than honeybees are. So next we'll just go through uh, some of the different types of native bees we have here in Illinois. This is just um, a few different groups. This is definitely not you know, kind of the end all be all of the native bees. There's a lot of other different kinds. Um, these are just some of the ones we typically um, see uh, or see more often than others. Um, so bumblebees, I'm sure you've all uh, seen bumblebees before. These are actually native to all continents um, but Australia and Antarctica. Um, here in Illinois, there are about 11 species of bumblebees in Illinois, um, 46 species um, north of Mexico, so several different species. Um, they'll do something called buzz pollination. So for this, um, they'll actually kind of unhook their wings from their flight muscles, um, and they'll kind of shake those muscles, uh, and that will shake their whole body. And this is a, a frequency, frequency close to a middle C uh, musical note. So if you're ever on Jeopardy or need some useless trivia, there you go. Um, and this vibration um, releases pollen from the, the flowers. And some of our native plants here in North America um, stuff like tomatoes, peppers, blueberries, cranberries, um, that actually they need that frequency to release their pollen. So these bumblebees are much more efficient at pollinating those types of plants um, than, say, honeybees that can't do that buzz pollination. Um, they also operate in cooler temperatures. Um, so when, when honeybees aren't going to be out flying, you will see um, bumblebees. You tend to see them earlier um, in the year. They don't need as warm temperatures because, again, they, they can disengage those their wings from their flight muscles and shake and kind of warm themselves up. Uh, bumblebees are social insects, so they will build um, hives with more than one um, generation of stuff in there. So this is what a bumblebee hive looks like. These are typically, uh, a lot of times, going to be in the ground or some other type of cavity. Um, they will, most species will build and provision um, their own nest. There are some bumblebee species out there that will parasitize um, other uh, bee nests, so they'll go in, uh, lay their eggs, own eggs in there, and kind of try to take over those nests. Um, and they are generalist pollinators, so they will 
visit a wide variety of different flowers. Different flowers, um, they don't specialize on one specific type of flowers like some species of bees do. Um, and those colonies um, tend to have anywhere between 50 and 400 um, individuals in those. Uh, carpenter bees, um, if you've got you know, unpainted wood anywhere around your house or something like that, there's a good chance you've encountered these. Uh, carpenter bees tend to be mostly tropical. Um, we do have the eastern carpenter bee um, here in Illinois, um, and these are large uh, bees. And you can tell these apart from uh, bumblebees. Um, carpenter bees, um, their abdomen um, is bare, doesn't have much hair, if any, on there. Um, and shiny, or as bumblebees are going to be, the whole body is going to be fuzzy. Um, so that's how you can tell those two apart. Um, they primarily are going to visit large open faced flowers. <laughs> you can't leave again. Let <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> Down here towards the bottom so they can get in and get that nectar out without having to go through the flower. Um, they call this stealing because they're not actually picking up any pollen or transferring any pollen. They're just taking that nectar. So they're not really doing anything for the flower. Um, sometimes carpenter bees are considered a pest. Galleries and lay their eggs in there. Um, and if you do have a problem with these, um, if you paint that wood, um, they do not find painted wood attractive. Um, if you have raw wood that's not painted, they find that much more attractive. So paint that wood and you can hopefully uh, reduce or eliminate your problems with carpenter bees. Um, carpenter bees can be solitary or social to eastern carpenter bee. Um, sometimes you will get um, several different females uh, together um, kind of in a nest. There's only going to be one female um, that's going to be laying eggs and going out and provisioning stuff, though those others just kind of wait there, um, kind of hoping maybe she'll die off and they can take over um, a lot of times. Um, they nest in wood or they're Nesting wood and they're tunnel nesting. Um, they will build and provision their own nests. Um, so they don't tend to use nest over again a lot of times. Um, they're again generalist pollinators, so they will visit a wide variety of different flowers. Um, they're also small carpenter bees, so these are going to be much smaller. Uh, these tend to be um, shiny, sparsely haired. Um, they're black, blue, or green in color. Um, and a lot of them have yellow or white markings on their face. Um, they have a lot weaker jaw jaws than large carpenter bees, so instead of burrowing into wood, they're actually going to build their nests um, in the pithy centers of stems, so something like this right here. Um, they are solitary bees, so you're going to have um, one female laying eggs in each um, nest. Um, they do build and provision their own nests, and they're also um, generalist pollinators. The next up are mason bees. Mason bees, um, if you grow fruit trees, um, you've probably heard about uh, mason bees. Um, Osmia um, is kind of the more, more famous of the group, but there are several um, different genera of bees that are considered mason bees. Um, they are important in an orchard, particularly fruit fertilization. Um, the reason they're called mason bees is that they use mud to divide their brood cells. So if you look at this picture on the bottom here, uh, you can see each one of these little galleries has got a little mud plug. Um, at the end of it there, and that's going to seal off that brood cell from the others. Um, these bees are going to go out and collect pollen balls. And they're going to put those, mix that a little nectar in with that. They're going to put those balls in this chamber. They'll lay an egg on that. Um, that egg will hatch. The larvae will feed on that pollen ball um, and develop then. And all of these bees um, will all emerge at about the same time. I'm not really sure how that is, but this egg that is laid first will finish its development about the same time as the egg that is laid last. So that way that first egg isn't that first bee isn't having to crawl out through all those other um, brood cells killing all those other ones. They all emerge um, about the same time. Um, these bees are solitary. Um, they nest in tunnels. Um, these tunnels could be galleries made by beetles. Um, it could be in wood or pithy stems. Um, and this is one um, that you can actually buy nests and uh, put on your yard to attract them yourselves. And um, when we get into talking about different things you can do in the garden about um, attracting and making your gardens better for native pollinators, we'll talk about um, building nests and stuff for mason bees.
Um, they do build and provision their own nests. Uh, most of them are generalist pollinators. There are a few species um, that are specialists. There's one that is a specialist on mock orange. Um, it's only going to visit mock orange. So if you don't have any mock orange around, you're not going to see um, that particular bee. Uh, next up are leaf cutter bees. Um, so they're going to cut leaves or petals um, to line their the inside of their nests with. Um, and these tend to be um, thinner leaved um, plants uh, without a lot of veins. Um, a lot of times they'll visit a lot. Some of their favorite plants are rose, um, ash, lilac, Virginia creeper. Um, so if you have a rose bush and you see um, these nice notches cut into them, you've probably got some leaf cutter bees around there. Um, this damage is cosmetic. This really isn't anything um, you need to worry about unless you have an incredibly high number of leaf beetle or leaf cutter bees, and you only have and you have a lone rose plant. Um, this isn't anything you need to be concerned about. Um, you know, you don't need to spray or anything for them. You're going to end up killing those bees. Um, they are solitary nesting. Um, again, they tunnel in nests, and what they'll do is they'll line those individual brood cells with leaves, and again, cap those with leaves. So that's why they're cutting those leaves um, from those plants. And again, they'll um, go to galleries made by beetles, wood pithy stems, or man-made um, habitats, just like mason bees. Um, and again, like mason bees, they're mostly generalists, but there are some that specialize on asters and plants in the pea families. Sweat bees, uh, so it's nice and hot out and you're sweating a lot, um, there's a chance um, you've gotten a visit from these. Um, they are in the family Halictidae. There's a, quite a few different um, genera um, that you'll find these in. Um, they're about one quarter or three quarters of an inch long, um, so they're quite small. Uh, most of them are going to nest in the ground. A few of them will uh, nest in rotten wood. So again, you know, it's good to have wood, rotten wood and stuff out um, in your garden, stuff like that. Uh, they're attracted to your perspiration. They're trying to get the moisture and a lot, mostly the salts out of there. Um, so that's why they're coming and trying to drink your sweat. Um, they can be solitary or social, again, depending on the species. Um, they will build and provision their own nest. Um, there are some that will parasitize other um, bee nests, and they tend to be general generalist pollinators, so visit a wide variety of flowers. Um, here are just a few examples of some of the different flowers that are attractive uh, to bees. So up top here, uh, top left, uh, foxglove beard tongue, uh, wild indigo. So you have a couple different colors of wild indigo here. Um, top right. Um, Agastache anise hyssop um, is another one. Bottom left, um, smooth, leaf a smooth leaf aster and monardia. Um, over here, so again, see more of those purple um, white colors that they find attractive. And again, these are some other popular plants if you have native wildflower gardens. You're more than likely going to have a few of these uh, in there. Um, so the, most of the plants I've talked about um, are kind of our herbaceous perennials, uh, but trees and shrubs are also important uh, when it comes to pollinators, particularly bees, um, and especially early in the early in the year. Um, that's when most of our our trees are going to be blooming. A lot of our herbaceous um, perennials haven't emerged yet, so haven't started flowering. So trees like maples, um, willows, red buds, lead plant, um, all those are going to be blooming early in the year. They're going to be a good source of nectar and pollen for those bees so when they get out early in the year and there's not many flowers out there, a lot of times they're going to be visiting trees. So if you want to have, you know, kind of support bee populations, um, think about getting some of these flowering trees um, and shrubs um, that bees and other pollinators are going to visit. All right, and um, just a few notes on native plants. Um, so most of the plants I've talked about have been native plants. People tend to think that native plants are far superior to non-native plants. Um, in some cases, um, this is true, um, but there are some things you want to consider um, about native plants before you go you know, all crazy with them. Um, it kind of depends on how you want to define um, native plants. So some people 
anything that's native North America or the United States, that's good enough for them. They consider that a native plant. Um, others, they want something that's native to their state, that's fine. And others, you know, want even more local. They want something that's specific, native to that county, um, stuff like that. So you kind of, you know, native plants, what is native is kind of up to you. There's no kind of hard set rule um, to that. Um, and just because it's native um, doesn't mean it's a good garden plant. Some of our native plants can get um, rather large, can be rather weedy. Um, so you don't necessarily want to grow those in a garden, stuff like that. Um, they have fewer disease or pest problems. Native plants are going to have disease, diseases and pests, just like any other plant. A lot of times when we see native plants, they're kind of going to go out in nature, so we don't really tend to notice those things. You know, you get those in, you plant them by your front door, you're going to have a much lower tolerance for pests and disease than you would if something's out um, in nature, so to speak. Um, you know, a lot of times people think native plants will grow better. Um, when we talk about cold hardiness, that's the case. Um, however, you know, when we get into soils, a lot of our suburban soils, the top soil has been stripped off, um, so we kind of have that crummy subsoil. Um, so that's not really, you know, all the very good soil to grow plants in, so our native plants aren't necessarily going to do any better in that. Um, a lot of times we have mycorrhizal fungi that are associated with our native plants that may not be present in soils. Um, so that mycorrhizal fungi is going to help them get um, nutrients and stuff from the soil, help them be a little more successful. So if that's not there, you know, those plants aren't necessarily going to be um, any better um, than our ornamental, non-native ornamental plants. Um, and just because it's native doesn't mean they're more desirable um, than non-native plants. Um, those pictures over there, um, that's poison ivy. Um, that's definitely not a desirable plant, um, but it is a native plant. So just because it's native doesn't mean you know, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. So here are um, some different tips um, that you can go through um, and do for your garden um, to kind of make it more attractive um, to pollinators, maybe make it a little a little safer for pollinators. So when we're doing pollinator gardens, we want to plant in clumps um, rather than a single plant kind of here and there. Um, pollinators are going to be much more attracted to a clump of, clump of flowers. Um, it's going to be easier to find, uh, much more appealing. Um, those clumps are, you know, there's more food available when you have a bunch of flowers clumped together. So they're going to go to that instead of, you know, a lone flower or a lone plant out on own where it's going to be kind of a limited amount of food right there. Um, when you are planting na native plants, um, go for the kind of the true native species, um, not necessarily the native or the garden cultivars of native plants. Um, a lot of times those are bred um, to be more appealing to us, not necessarily uh, to pollinators. And there's actually um, a PhD student at University of Vermont um, uh, named Annie White, and she's actually doing some research on this. Um, I actually came across this after I put this presentation together. So I can put um, the link to her website in the chat box so you can check it out more. Um, but some of the things they found um, for their preliminary results, um, the more manipulated the cultivars become, um, the less attractive they become to pollinators. Um, a lot of times they're going to have less nectar. Um, the, flower, the colors aren't going to be as attractive, that, or the nectar is going to have fewer sugars. Um, in it, and stuff, so it's going to be less attractive uh, to, their, to those pollinators. Um, they did find, though, that some of the native uh, cultivars are more attractive. Um, those tend to be the ones that are um, the open pollinated seed cultivars. A lot of times those have longer blooming periods, um, so it just kind of depends. But as a general rule, um, the native ours or your native cultivars aren't as attractive to our, our native pollinators as the kind of the true species are. Uh, when you're planting a garden, you also want at least three different types of flowers um, per growing season. Um, that way you have kind of a selection, a variety of different flowers that pollinators can go to. And you want stuff blooming um, from early spring to late fall. So you've always got something blooming in the garden that these pollinators can visit. So if you're, you're putting together a garden, you kind of want it to look something like this. You've got stuff blooming from March into October multiple species blooming um, in those different areas. And then, you know, that March, April, 
you know, that's a lot of times where your trees can come into play. They're going to be blooming um, in that period. And when you get into October, um, later in the year, a lot of times that's going to be um, your goldenrod, um, stuff like that. Uh, when you're putting together a garden, you also want to provide habitat um, for nesting and egg laying um, for your pollinators. So shrubs, tall grasses, um, low-growing plants. Um, you'll have stuff like butterflies um, that'll hang out there at night. Uh, moths can hang out there during the day. Uh, we talked about some of our, our bees, you know, our mason bees, our um, leaf cutter bees, our small carpenter bees, stuff that will nest in those pithy stems. You, know, you want those available so they can uh, nest in those. You don't necessarily want to have a perfectly clean garden. Um, leave some of those stems and stuff up so that those insects can nest in them. And obviously, if you have a lot of disease problems, you want to get rid of those. Um, if you don't have too much disease pressure, think about leaving some of those around so you can have some some nesting options for those insects and you aren't eliminating any nests that may be in there. Um, a good chunk of our native bees will nest in bare ground, so you want to have patches of bare ground um, that they can tunnel into, um, like this bee right here, to build their nest in the ground. Um, patches of fallen branches and brush, again, that's going to be attractive to stuff like beetles, um, flies, stuff that's kind of resting um, for the night or during the day, um, lay their eggs in, um, stuff like that. You also want layers in the landscape, so you don't want everything to be kind of the same height. You want different heights because different insects are going to look for different nesting areas. So if you have a variety of different layers, um, stuff like that, it's going to be that much more attractive to a variety of different insects. Um, you also want to leave dead tree trunks um, in your landscape. That's going to be good for your wood nesting bees um, and beetles. So you know, if you get a tree cut down, you know, maybe think about not grinding it down to the ground. Leave you know four or five feet sticking up so you can have um, habitat um, for those for those wood nesting insects. Uh, like we talked about before, um, mason bees and leaf cutter bees, um, they do have you know, homes you can buy to attract those or to, to have give them habitat um, to live in. Um, just a few notes on those. You want to avoid using solid wood blocks um, and bamboo. Uh, pests will tend to build up in these, and after two or three years, um, you get so many pests built up, you don't really um, have many bees anymore. You kind of want to stick to the paper straws. Um, you don't want plastic straws, but paper straws, um, reeds, um, those are pretty easy to open up. Or you can have wood trays um, that are sawed in half, so you can open those up and clean. So that way you can clean all that stuff out, so you don't have to worry about um, pests building up in those nests. Um, and if you're using reeds and stuff like that, you kind of want to arrange those in a 3D pattern. Um, or if you're using blocks of wood, scorch the front of that, so you have different kinds of patterns and stuff on there, so it makes it a little bit easier to, for the bees to find uh, their individual nests. A uh, few more things um, you can do um, in your garden uh, for pollinators. Um, so just like us, um, insects don't like getting blown around in the wind or getting rain on. Um, so kind of have protection, um, shelter for that. So that's where your brush piles, uh, stuff like that comes into play. Um, you know, allow for an untidy garden. Um, you, you're going to need to be willing to accept some plant damage. Um, just remember, you know, that, that hornworm that's chewing up your tomatoes right now is going to eventually turn into um, one of these hawk moths. So if you're going to have a pollinator garden, you're going to have to be willing to let plants get chewed up, eaten. Um, you know, beetles are going to chew up flower petals, stuff like that. So you're going to have to be willing to have some uh, damage uh, to your plants. Um, you want to try to reduce or eliminate the use of your pesticides. Uh, you know, try to follow integrated pest management or IPM practices, um, where you kind of use um, pesticides as a last result. Um, if you're going to use pesticides, um, try, use stuff that, try using stuff that's safer um, for pollinators. Um, so a lot of times we recommend um, Bacillus thuringiensis cristachii, or BTK, um, if you're trying to control um, caterpillar-type pests. Obviously, if you're trying to rear caterpillars, that's not a good idea. Um, but that's going to be something that's going to be safe to use around bees, um, stuff like that. Um, when you are using pesticides, you know, make sure you read and follow all label directions. Um, most of the time they'll have any special 
if there's any special instructions on how you need to apply this when pollinators are present, um, that'll be on there. Um, you definitely don't want to apply any pesticides to plants that are blooming. Um, so you need to either do that before they bloom or wait until they're done. Um, a lot of times, try to spray early in the morning or late in the day <clears throat> when a lot of our pollinators, particularly bees, um, aren't out and active. Um, you know, if it's real windy, try to avoid spraying so you don't get any drift um, on your desirable plants or, and, you know, where your pollinators can get caught up in um, and stuff like that. Um, again, remember caterpillars grow up to be moths and butterflies, so don't kill every single caterpillar you see out there. You may want to keep a few of those around if you want moths and butterflies around your garden. Um, it's also a good idea to watch your garden, keep a journal, um, kind of give you an idea of what's out there, you know, what flowers are, are real attractive to stuff. You know, think about maybe putting some more of those in. You know, is there stuff that, you know, insects aren't visiting at all? Kind of give you an idea of what's going on in the garden. You can kind of go back and compare year to year and see what your pollinator um, populations are like. All right, so that is all I have right now. So here is, if you have any questions, um, you can type them in the chat box. And here's my um, contact info. Um, if you have questions at any point, um, feel free to give me a call, send me an email. Uh, I'll be more than happy to help you. Um, this presentation and all of our other uh, past four seasons gardening series um, are put up, or in, in, in the case of this one, will be put up on YouTube. Um, there's the webpage, I think, to try to get that done within a week or so after um, the presentation. So if you want to go back and review something or catch up on some ones that you missed in the past, um, go check those out. And with that, I'll take some questions. Um, and these are just some different websites I used making this uh, presentation. They also have a lot of good information on um, gardening for pollinators, uh, pollinators in general, um, different flowers, stuff like that. So if there's any questions, I'll go ahead and take those now. Yes, give me just a second and I will um, get that website for you. see the chart and, you, and that those flowers you know those aren't flowers you necessarily need to pick those are just some um, that I had pulled together that I'd use for other presentations about you know pollinator gardening so this is not definitely not the end all be all for picking flowers for pollinator gardens just some different ideas out there Um, and that Illinois Wildflowers, that info is a really good website. Um, it's got profiles on all kinds of different native plants. Um, and he also lists the different types of pollinators that will visit um, those plants. So if you're interested in the particular type of pollinator that visits a plant, um, try checking that website out. You may be able to find um, that information there. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions?
All right, there's a question. Are there specific bee species that are declining or are all declining? Um, I don't know if you could say all, but there are. I think they're seeing there are quite a few bee species declining. Most of the research and stuff has been done on honeybees. Again, those are those are almost treated like livestock. There's a lot more research that goes into honeybees um, than there are native bees. Um, so, there, so that I know there's a lot of bumblebee species that you know, have been present in areas that they haven't seen for years. Um, so I, it's pretty safe to say that there's quite a few, if not most, bee species are probably seeing some sort of decline. There's just a lot of them, there's not a lot of research on it. Uh, do the mason bee straws need to be sealed on one end? Um, no, they will um, they will seal it on their own if they want it sealed. So most of the time when you get those paper straws, they're just like a, a regular plastic straw that you use. Uh, does U of I recommend the use of Roundup? Um, yes, as long as you use it properly, follow the label. Um, that is something we recommend using for weed control in the appropriate situations. Any other questions out there? I'll give you a couple more minutes. Um, so websites for activities for kids, um, lessons for teachers. Um, both Pollinator Partnership and the Xerxes Society, I think both of those have uh, stuff on there. I'm trying to think of it. Extension has any. Uh, I know there's um, some of the junior master gardener lessons. Um, they've got some stuff with pollinators. Uh, so I don't know where you're where you're located at, Laura, but that may be something you could you know, contact your local office see if they have um, one of the junior master gardener manuals. Um, and nothing else, um, shoot me an email if you have kind of any specific things you have in mind. All right, Ag in the classroom has some pollinator activities as well, so. Many people fear bees. Do I have any ways to dispel the fear of bees? Um, I think a lot of that is um, not only bees, but just kind of insects in general. I think a lot of that starts with kids, teaching kids that insects um, are not evil. Um, most insects out there are beneficial. Um, as far as specifically to bees, I don't know, maybe uh, kind of discuss the importance of bees to people. Um, you know, bees are not going to be aggressive. The only time they're, you're going to get stung is if you, you know, for the most part, you know, particularly with honeybees, bother their hive. You know, you can go out. I wouldn't recommend doing this, but, you know, you can go out with a bumblebee when it's pollinating the flower. You can go out and pet it. I mean, they're not going to, for the most part, bother you, but you know, if you go out and do that and you get stung, don't blame it on me, but um, I would say just kind of explain the importance of bees um, to people, and there's really no need to be worried about them. Most people, when they get stung, is probably going to be stung by a wasp, not a bee. Do Illinois farmers import bees from other states? Uh, we're talking about honeybees, uh, bringing hives in. Um, some may, I don't, I don't know how many do, if any, uh, mostly when you're talking about 
importing honeybees and stuff for pollination, a lot of that's going to be um, California um, for almonds, stuff like that. They'll um, bring them in from Florida. They'll take them out. Um, kind of the Dakotas um, during the summer with all the clover and stuff. So there's there's maps out there that will show you um, kind of the, the movement of honeybees over over the year. Um, and some of those hives can travel thousands of miles um, over the course of a year. But as far as Illinois, I don't, some may, but there's, if there are some that do, there's probably not very many that do. We don't have a lot of, most of the crops we grow here, you know, corn and soybeans don't require, you know, honeybees and stuff. Last call for questions. Um, if you happen to think of any questions you know, after I get off here, um, again, feel free to give me a call, send me an email, um, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. All right, I'm not seeing any questions, so um, thank you all. Um, for logging in and listening to this. I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. Um, enjoy the rest of your day.